Hello everyone, my name's Adam and welcome back to the channel. Now, 3D printers seem to be getting cheaper and cheaper by the day, it seems. But can you get a printer that's both cheap and good? Well, I've got the Ender 3 here from Creality. It's definitely cheap, so let's find out if it's any good. So what is the Ender 3? It's an open source FDM printer from a company in Shenzhen called Creality. Yes, that's right, an open source printer from China. It has a 220, 220 by 250 build volume, Bowden style extruder, single Z-axis lead screw, a non-removable heat bed, V-slot kinematics, 24 volt electronic system based on the Milzy board with a 1 16th micro stepping A4988 stepper driver. Stepper drivers, more precisely. Included in the box, you have an EU power cable, power adapter that doesn't actually fit the supplied cable, unfortunately, acupuncture needle for cleaning the nozzle, some basic assembly tools, side cutters, a bit of filament, a scraper for removing prints from the bed, and a micro SD card and reader. The Ender 3 is a kit, so of course the first thing I did was build it. For me, it took me about an hour, but that was on stream, so you could probably complete it in about 30 minutes. It is partly pre-assembled, so you don't have to do it all entirely from scratch, which I think works pretty well. The instructions are in colour, and they're very clear, and they list all the parts you need for each step, so they're pretty easy to follow. All the bags are labelled with the, what's in them, and they're all separated quite nicely, so that again makes it easier to select the parts and find the parts that you need to identify. The power supply comes pre-wired, as does everything into the electronics board, so there's no messing around with mains wires or lots of fiddly little connectors. There was no damage to any of the components, so everything seemed to ship fairly well, uh, apart from the main base, which did have a little bit of a twist. No, it wasn't an actual twist of the parts. They were just not assembled squarely, so maybe that was in the pre-assembly rather than during the delivery. It's very easy to fix though. Four bolts at the side, just loosen them when you're on a flat surface, sort of give it a bit of a wiggle, and then you'll be good as gold. The frame itself has many similarities to the CR10, but it is significantly smaller, and as a result, probably slightly stiffer. The base is formed from three 40 by 40 extrusions. You have 20 by 40s up the sides and holding the bed, and then a 2020 along the top. All the parts of the printer are made for metallic or injection molded parts, which gives it a very good quality feel overall and makes everything really quite stiff, which is useful for the frame. The V-slot wheels and their triangular configuration across the extrusions make for a very rigid motion system. However, it appears that the angle of the wheels seems to be slightly different to the angle in the extrusion, which causes some excessive wear, but doesn't seem to be too bad. After finishing the build, I ran the test print, which came out fairly well, although the PLA filament included was not enough to actually finish the print. So I had to sort of add other bits as I went, pausing the printer to switch filaments. However, I then decided that actually my flat looks better without fire. So I decided to analyze the safety features to see what was enabled. To do that, I used the method proposed by Tom Sandlandra in his video on 3D printer safety, and I'll leave a link for that in the description below. The results that you see on now are what I found through doing those tests. To fix these issues, I first needed to flash a bootloader, which requires an Arduino Uno. In order to put the bootloader onto the control board, you can then get your firmware and flash that. I used the TH3D firmware, which I probably wouldn't recommend, but was available at the time and the Ender 3 open source firmware wasn't around then. So that's what I used. Moving on now to the noise levels, there are some good parts and bad parts here. Firstly, the hot end cooling fan is really quite loud. It's almost as loud as an E3D 30mm fan on the V6. It's just obnoxiously loud and quite unpleasant. So I'd suggest you try and either dampen this enclosure, this sort of cage around the hot end, because that can make a difference or replace it with a slightly lower RPM fan that hopefully still has sufficient cooling. The stepper motors make that general whiny sound that you get from A4988 stepper drivers, which gets a bit annoying a bit quickly, but it is drowned out by the sound of the cooling fan. The part cooling fan, the power supply fan, and the general kinematics overall are fairly quiet, especially compared to this very noisy fan on the front. If I was to replace that, then I might be able to detect the noise of other parts a little bit more, but as it is, they are not too bad. So of course, now you want to know what the print quality is like. And while this is quite difficult to analyze, given that the profile is not necessarily fully locked down, I can tell you a few things. The tolerance was fairly good. I got all the way down on to 0.2 on this tolerance test. Unfortunately, the 0.21 is completely solid. The Maker's Muse tolerance test, however, 
Well, that didn't go particularly well. In fact, not well at all. I did notice there was quite a bit of stringing on this printer. I managed to reduce it somewhat by modifying the profile, but it still seems to stick around no matter what I do. Printing PETG had some quite serious issues, and I think that might be as a result of the hot end cooling fan sending cold air to the printer, to the, uh, to the print throughout. PLA, however, does produce some very good prints. Even in bridging, it seems quite good, so the cooling is fairly effective. The printer certainly does its best with PLA, where I've had definitely the best results. It's worth noting that the extruder hobbed gear that pushes the filament through to the hot end does seem to slip if you try and push too fast. So my recommendation is try and print on fairly low layer heights, such as 0 0.16, 0 0.12, somewhere around there. Overall on the print quality, although I haven't had huge amounts of success, I would say a lot of it's down to the print profile and not having enough time to set one up that's really well dialed in. I think with more time to set that up right, really dial in those retraction settings and wipe to get the uh, stringing to go away, then I think you're going to be in a much better position with this printer. It's all very well having good print quality, but if you can't remove the prints from the bed or stick them to the bed in the first place, then that's still really no good. Well, there's no auto bed leveling here, so everything you do has got to be manual. Fortunately, these large wheels do make the adjustments quite easy, but unfortunately, there's a definite bow in my bed. Bow, what is it called? Dishing. So the middle of my bed is quite significantly lower than the four corners. So in order to actually get it to a level where I can print, I need to level the four corners and then turn all of them a further quarter turn to get the middle up. Now, because of that dishing, that also limits the amount of print area I can effectively use because as I move to the side, the nozzle gets too close to the bed and the filament doesn't come out properly. So either it'll get so stuck that I'll never be able to remove it, or it'll just kind of clog the nozzle as it tries to print that first layer. Either way, not a great result. That being said, the leveling system does work quite well. By making sure I tightened everything down sort of a little bit extra before I did the leveling system, the springs are quite tight so the knobs don't come loose. So I can go quite a few prints without having to re-level anything. Now, that's all down to making sure you have your Z-stop in the right place. And this can be a little bit inconsistent as well. So one print that starts with the first layer in just the right place, the next one will, might have a slightly different result on this and then it will come out slightly differently. So not perfect, but it still does stick, so it's not too bad. That build surface itself is a sort of build tack. I don't know if it's actually is, probably isn't, it's probably a clove, but it does stick actually quite well to prints almost to the point in some cases where hacking at it just doesn't feel like the right solution to get it off. And that brings me to the removability of that surface. Having that spring steel sheet on the Mark III has completely spoiled me to the point where I now feel that this, having a completely bonded down surface, just seems pretty ridiculous. Having to attack it with a scraper to get a print off the bed just seems balmy. There's gonna be quite a lot of upgrades for this printer. It's very similar to the CR10, so you'll probably find that a lot of the modifications for that printer could be useful here too. Not only that, but the Ender 3 itself has a pretty decent community already. The fact that this printer is now open source means there's a lot more data, so making more significant modifications to the design or to certain areas where detail and getting the dimensions right can be quite difficult is gonna be a whole lot easier now that data is available. I might actually do a separate video listing all the upgrades and why I suggest doing them and what you should do in order to execute those upgrades. Because, I mean, auto bed leveling, another great example of how this printer could be improved by a fairly low cost upgrade. So in conclusion then, how good is the Ender 3? Well, the kinematic system, great. All metal components, also great. Safety features, not really great at all. But the basics here, the basics are right. And for the cost, that's quite a good option, I think. It leaves you a lot of money left in your budget probably to do upgrades, which you'll probably want to do. And the sort of pre-built nature of it, or partly pre-built nature, gives you enough understanding of the printer, of kind of what goes where and how it works, so that you can do the upgrades. You can understand that, oh, this does this, this does that. So if I change this, it will change that. And that gives you a good understanding of 3D printing. So for a beginner, I think that's really quite excellent. The fact that the power supply is pre-wired with the mains wiring means you don't have to fiddle around with that. But even so, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this build for children without having them monitored during build and or usage. The safety considerations mean that you will need to flash firmware, 
probably also the bootloader as it doesn't come with that either but there's, there's not a lot of work to do and it can make a significant difference especially if you don't want your house on fire so that's it for my review on the ender 3. this printer was provided to me by banggood but no money has changed hands however if you'd like to support the channel and you like the printer i'll leave an affiliate link down below for you to purchase the printer in which i get a small kickback thank you very much for watching don't forget to like and subscribe, follow me on Instagram and Twitter for behind the scenes and other random stuff like that, and I will see you in the next one.